Is anybody on Facebook right now? Les, do you want to just make sure that when I click this, give me a thumbs up that we're live? Make sure you're in as yourself on the Buffalo page. Yeah, but you're ready, Les? Okay. I'll give you a, uh, a wave when you got 30 seconds left. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Carley, I'm the president of the Buffalo Party, and I'm here today to moderate the debate between our two leadership candidates. On my left, I got uh, Philip Zajac from Estevan and Clint Arneson from Vanguard. Thank you gentlemen for coming. Uh, just a few rules of the debate today. We're gonna give both candidates uh, five minutes to speak. Then after that, we'll go right into the questions. The candidates will have two minutes to answer each question, and we're gonna alternate. We flipped a coin in the back, real technical, and uh, Phil won the toss. So Phil is gonna start with his five minutes, then Clint, and then we'll get right into the questions. We have about uh, almost 30 questions, and I don't know that we're gonna get to all of them today. These were all uh, sent in by uh, members of the party and supporters. And uh, good luck, gentlemen. And I want to, on behalf of the board of directors, thank both of you for putting your name forward to lead our party into the 2024 election. Just so you guys know, um, we did have seven applications sent out, which is uh, amazing. And a, a few of them didn't come back because of family commitments and time commitments, and they just couldn't make it work. And Phil and Clint sent their application in, and they passed the vetting process. And now the uh, the board and the leadership selection committee would like to thank them. So we'll start off right now with uh, Phil Zajac. Phil? Hi, and uh, thanks everybody for taking the time to tune in today to watch this uh, debate. Um, so basically, I guess what I'm going to do is just give a little bit of uh, history about myself and uh, my background. And uh, I was very fortunate. I grew up in Regina and I went to the U.S. to play college football. And uh, in my education, I have a bachelor's degree in sociology. And uh, I have about a dozen classes in government that I took, including U.S. foreign policy, constitutional law, and a lot of these types of classes that uh, um, you don't know why you're taking them when you're younger. And uh, it turned out that they were very important for being involved in the Buffalo Party because a lot of that uh, practical education uh, came into play. So, um, also, I uh, have been very involved in politics and in my community in Estevan. I've been a football coach at the high school for 12 years now. I coached girls softball for seven years. Uh, I'm a retired kinsman because I'm too old, uh, but I still uh, help out with the kinsmen, uh, some of their projects they do every year. I was chairman of the library board for Southeast Saskatchewan for six years, uh, which is something I believe in. And uh, I don't know if you remember when the provincial government tried to take away the library money uh, from the budget a few years ago. Uh, we steamrolled the whole process and organized the province and uh, uh, had them uh, reevaluate their cuts and we got our money back and it was one of the uh, proudest things that we had done as a, as a group because uh, we probably had 200 people in Estevan outside uh, with children to grandparents all reading books and uh, the, the provincial government had no choice but to give us back our funding so that was a, a big win for us. and. Um, 
Also, I, I was on a, the Southeast Economic Development Board, which was a, a board that uh, basically looked at projects that we could start and uh, uh, optimize in Southeast Saskatchewan. And one of the ones that we spearheaded was we were pushing for the 20 of Highway 39 from the border towards uh, Regina. That project, uh, we never got the complete twinning, but it did lead to by you know to uh, passing lanes on that highway, and it, it is a it is a high traffic, high volume highway, and and uh, at least with the beginning of the twinning of the highway, it gives a uh, or not the twinning, but the uh, passing lanes, um, it's a start, and and uh, anybody who drives that highway knows now that with the passing lanes, it's a lot safer uh, for everybody, especially uh, young drivers, you know, who are are commuting back and forth. So that was one of the other projects that. Uh, you know that we kind of spearheaded. Um, I think that uh, as far as politics, uh, I always uh, <clears throat> I feel honored to be able to represent the people in my community and uh, the people of Saskatchewan. I think that it's time for uh, people who are not politicians, because we're not politicians. We're just people who care about uh, our community and our province, and and uh, it's not easy, you know, to. Uh, to take this step and you know I want to thank Clint for stepping up to do the same thing um, a lot of people think that they you know they would like to do this and you know uh, be a leader of a party but it's a big commitment and it's a life-changing decision and the, th the reason we do this is because we care um, none of us are polished politicians none of us have uh, uh, been in in any form of the legislature or as an MP before and when you look at the group of candidates that we ran in the last election you know who are we uh, we're ranchers, we're, we're bankers, we're uh, uh, trucking company guys, people who just care about the community and it's just time to straighten things out in this province. The, the uh, I call it entitlement that politicians feel federally and provincially right now is amazing. And, and when we talk about common sense, uh, if you haven't, if you, how, how do we expect someone to be able to create a budget when you've never ran a business and you've never had to make a payroll? And so what I'm saying is, is when you take a group of people who just care and are in the business world and have done those things, uh, it's an opportunity to get back to common sense politics and that's what we need in Saskatchewan. We need, we need a deal that will take care of the people of Saskatchewan first and we need to have strong enough personalities to actually do it. Uh, simply, simply uh, putting on a facade of, you know, we're going to stop the carbon tax and go to court. Oh, we lost. Um, guess what? Uh, that doesn't matter. We can stop the carbon tax ourselves. Thanks, Bill. Clint? Hello, I'm Clint Arson from Vanguard. I've been uh, an electrician. Uh, worked for different companies, been up to Fort Mac, uh, been up to Cigar Lake. Uh, a lot of big projects. Um, seen government. Um, do deals. Uh, I was up in Fort Mac when actually with the federal government lined up selling uh, Suncor Petrocan um, for billions of dollars, but in the long run, um, Suncor got the deal and the taxpayers got really nothing out of it because all those jobs lost was taxes, money lost from lost income. So really they gave it away. And then on top of that, they were able to mothball it so they're not paying the royalties that they would have because they didn't have to build Voyager as fast as they needed to. So, and that's that. Um, on my other side, I volunteer uh, with SARS Saskatchewan. Uh, we've been building uh, different areas of the province, uh, getting the word out. So I know what it's like to try to have a small group of people and growing it. Um, it takes time, uh, bit by bit, uh, getting the right people in the right positions. And, and I'd like to thank Phil for also stepping up and, and uh, taking on leadership. Like he says, it's, it's uh, not uh, for everybody and, and it is a big commitment. And for us, uh, we're looking at uh, trying to make Saskatchewan uh, better. And like you said, we're not politicians. Uh, this is all new to us, but we're here to uh, looking after the rural areas and, and the small businesses that built this, this province and to keep it building. Um, instead of outsourcing our workforce to other provinces to come here for political gain from 
um, getting money from other provinces into to you know keep the people in power. Like he said, entitlement. And it's time to put Saskatchewan people first and building the, the, the economy in Saskatchewan and making everybody look at Saskatchewan instead of uh, a not, not as a, you know, give us money is, but we're here for making us, everybody look at us. So that's what we're here for. Thank you. Thanks, Clint. So we'll get into the questions now. Um, we're going to alternate. So Clint, you're going to answer the first question. Please share the main reason why you'd like to lead the Buffalo Party. That's a very good question. Um, and it's a tough question. I never even thought of that. Um, I just looked at, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, people that were putting their names forward. And I just figured that we needed to um, not just give it to, to one person when you're new, a new party, you just don't want somebody to be appointed and uh, saying, here you go, um, run it. Uh, to me, you need to have that democracy to make it look like we are a democracy um, party. So here I am. Thanks, Phil, same question. Uh, the, the, the reasons that I uh, decided to put my name forward to run for this position was, I think that uh, I have a strong personality and I think that that's something that uh, politicians lack right now. I think I um, can be a good voice and advocate for uh, my community and for the people of Saskatchewan. I think that the next election coming up is going to probably be, like we've said, one of the most important in the next 50 years. Uh, Saskatchewan has a lot to lose in the next election and, and we need a group of people that care enough about this province uh, to step forward and advocate for our communities, not for ourselves. Anymore. This is, this is politicians advocating for themselves has got to go. Uh, we need to advocate for the people that pay our wage and the people that we're representing, and that's gone. Uh, the the self-serving um, uh, politicians of today, uh, federally and provincially, it's, it's embarrassing. It's, it's like, uh, uh, when you look at <laughs> the stuff that's gone on recently with the Emergency Powers Act, uh, there's no reason for that to ever happen. Uh, the, the police and oversight of uh, politics in general is horrible and that's something that we need to fix as a group and, and uh, we need leaders who are strong enough to do it. Thanks, Phil. Phil, this next question is for you. What does the word accountability mean to you? Well, I think <clears throat> accountability is important and, you're, and as a leader, you're, you're accountable to a lot of people, not just, uh, not just your constituents, you're accountable to uh, the people of the province and the people of Canada because uh, the, the role that you're taking on uh, is going to affect daily lives of citizens from all over and I think that uh, the Buffalo Party has some very strong uh, intentions of making their politicians accountable uh, with the recall uh, mm -hmm. process that is available and it's never existed before so uh, politicians have basically once you're elected in you can do as little or as much as you want and there's very little accountability until the next election cycle. So I think that, um, uh, again, as, as being leader and being accountable to uh, not, not just yourself, but you got to be accountable to all of the people of the province and Canada. Clint, same question. To me, accountability is, is a very uh, strong word. Um, you got to make sure that you're um, upfront, honest, trustworthy, I mean, it's very easy to lose that uh, integrity um, when you're not. And if you're going to build a new party, you need to have all of those qualities as far as I'm concerned. Because just, you got to be accountable to yourself. Be able to look yourself in the mirror and saying, yes, this is who I am and this is what I want to do. And you got to be accountable from the people, listen to the people, and let them know that you're trustworthy of what you're saying and what you're doing as a person, because you're not just a person when you're the leader, you are the representative of the party. Thank you. Um, Clint, the next question's for you, and there's a little statement underneath that I just want to clarify before I ask the question. This question relates to COVID-19 response, but it could also, to apply, uh, could also apply to people with addictions. Um, 
and other relative areas in society. So how would you navigate the difficult line between individual choice and the government's responsibility to protect the vulnerable? That's a, that's a tough question once again, but it, and a good question. It comes down to health um, and me with my having a chronic illness, I can relate to some of this. Um, it's just because you go see a doctor and for a band-aid or whatever, um, you still have to take your own steps to um, be aware of your own health. You can't expect somebody else to do it for you. So you still have to put yourself in that position to do what's best for you in the way you think uh, it should be for you not being dictated to your own health. Uh, it should, should work because not all medications work for everybody and not all systems work for everybody. So you have to land up um, working with that to um, what's best for you. I mean, I went through two specials that are supposed to be the best and I uh, landed up uh, in Alberta and came back to Saskatchewan and seen two, uh, one internal specialist and then to a specialist in Regina that uh, got me the, on the right medication and has started all over. So that was a long two years and eight months, which I would have had the right doctors and the right prescriptions would have been half the time that I was off work. So. Can you read the question? Yeah, I'll repeat that again. Um, this question is in relation to the COVID-19 response, but can also be applied to people with addictions and other relative areas in society. How would you navigate the difficult line between individual choice and the government's responsibility to protect the vulnerable? Okay, so I think that we all know, um, just through information, that the uh, addiction problem in Saskatchewan is epidemic beyond COVID-19. Uh, there's been more deaths, I would say, than uh, from uh, opiate and uh, chemical overdoses. Uh, not to mention uh, the depression and, and uh, other mental health issues that have stemmed from the from the uh, Saskatchewan government's use of COVID-19. Uh, I think that, of course, we would always put the individual's choice first. So, uh, when I spoke about this uh, last election, uh, I said that the Saskatchewan government was going to put us in a lockdown and put us in face masks after the election, and it was 10 days to the day after the election was over that they did that. Uh, they said that they would never do that, and it was a two-week curve. Well, it's a two-year curve. The mental anguish that's happened to the people who've lost their businesses, lost their homes, uh, at an arbitrary shutdown by the provincial government, the addiction problem that is as entailed with alcohol and drug use in the province, because people have been locked in their homes, is atrocious. That should never happen, and as a Buffalo Party leader, I would never, never suggest that that lockdown occurs. Thanks. Uh, Phil, this question is for you first. Would you support term limits on MLAs and party leaders in Saskatchewan? And would you be willing to try and make the change happen in the provincial government going forward? I, I would support that 100% because what happens is, is you get politicians who become lifetime politicians. Uh, they don't have any other experience in life other than being a politician. And when you set term limits, what that, what that ensures is that there's new ideas, that new, uh, it, politics is about thought. So when you, when you have more people that are not involved from, for 20 years, you get new thoughts, you get new ideas, and I think you have a better politician. I think that uh, setting term limits is something that I would advocate for right away. And as we both know, uh, as running for leader, a two-year term is, is, is sufficient to be a leader, and then someone else should take over. Uh, there's no reason for someone to be uh, premier for, for 12 years. It, it doesn't make any sense, and I think that's when these lifetime politicians, that's when the entitlement starts to become part of their persona. They forget who they're serving, they forget what they're doing, and what they do is they think, hey, I'm entitled to this. And, and we've seen it recently, the SAS party, uh, if, if a board, questions what they've put out in the news, they're offended. And, and they, they're basically saying on the record, you're doubting what we're telling you? And, but that's, that's the public's job. They're not, just because they tell us something doesn't mean that it's accurate or true. 
And that's why I think terms is essential to be uh, term limits on, on no matter whether you're an MLA or premier. Clint, do you need me to repeat that? Or? No, I'm good. good. And I, I agree. I mean, there should be uh, a terms. I mean, you look down in the states where, where they've got, you know, they can do two terms as president. I mean, you get that turnover. You line up, you get, like Phil said, you get new change, new thoughts coming in. Um, and, and the party has to work that much harder to get, and that's after that second term, they got their leadership has to change to make that next president president. So uh, I'm all for it, where you now have your parties are going to not be stuck into, and you don't have these lifetimers that are going, well, I voted for this party because of this leader, and this leader is still going on for 20 years. But if he's only got a short term, the party is going to have to change with the times to allow to get re-elected. So I agree with uh, with Phil on that, where you need to have that, that those terms. Thank you. Uh, Clint, you're first on this one. As an elected representative, how would you encourage Western provincial governments that autonomy and or independence is a good plan for the Western people? Well, most people in this room and most people that support us are, are in that situation where we figured that the East has had the gravy long enough and it's time for it to, to shift to the West. We're the ones that have the resources. We're the ones that keep on feeding them. And it's time for us to have a choice to where our resources, how our resources are going to get marketed and have that power. We might have less people, but we're the ones that have all the resources. So why should we be listening to the East when they're not listening to us? So we need to either get them to start listening to make Canada Canada, or they're going to find out that the West is going to, and then you might even find out as the West separates that some of the Maritimes and everything else is going to want to join the West. Why? Because they're going to need us. So it's time for them to learn that they need us more than we need them. Thanks. Phil? I think the number one thing that uh, we need to do as a party and as a province is take action. Um, if you take action and show the other provinces, we need to lead by example and show that, you know what, we can do this. Because that's, that's the big fear of the other provinces wondering, well, you know, can we do this? And we, and we hear this too. You know, can, can, can Saskatchewan be autonomous? Yeah, I believe we can. There's there's enough ways out there for us to be the place to live in Canada. Um, so what we what we need to do is we need to create a buzz and an energy that um, people around start saying, "Wow, look what they're doing in Saskatchewan." You know what? They they're controlling their own immigration. They're controlling their own taxation. Well, we why can't we do that? We do that right now with Quebec, right? Now people in Saskatchewan say the same thing. So. We start to lead by example. We create an energy in Saskatchewan where we are pro-business. We create a better way of life, and people are going to want to move to Saskatchewan. They're going to want to bring their businesses here because this is the place to do business, and this is the place where the government is pro-Saskatchewan. And and there's so many different ways that we can we can do this uh, as a party, and we have so many great ideas when you start to look at our policies and our and our pillars. That uh, there's no reason why people shouldn't come to Saskatchewan and make this the best place to live in Canada. Thanks, Phil. Back to you again with this one. Uh, would you be willing to propose a system and procedure to recall MLAs when the public feels that they're not being served well? Uh, I'm 100% for a recall process. Uh, it shouldn't be easy. The, the, the recall process has to be a legitimate uh, process and, and uh, I think that you know, we've seen it happen. There's a, a politician in Alberta that kind of went through this, where his constituency felt that he wasn't being representative of the uh, people. He wasn't showing up at meetings, um, getting a paycheck, and they had no real recall process. So, um, again, that when we talk about accountability as politicians, you're accountable to your constituency and you're accountable to the people. And if you aren't performing and you're not doing your job, it's no different than if you. You know, if you work at the bank or you work at SAS Power, or you own a business, if you don't show up for work, well, guess what? You get fired. So why is it any different for a politician to not have that same 
responsibility to their career and to the, to the people they're representing. So if you're elected to represent your community and you don't do it, yeah, they can start a recall process and it's, and it's by a vote. Thanks. Clint? I totally agree with you, Phil. I think, I think we need to make politicians um, accountable for their actions and everything else. I mean, if you lined up breaking the law or whatever, I mean, recall should be, should be there. I mean, and, and the people in that community get to uh, decide uh, if they want to keep you or not. You know, if you aren't showing up, like you said, you know, if you can not show up and get paid, I mean, uh, who wouldn't want to stay home and, and uh, collect a paycheck, you know? So I think, you know, accountability is, is very, uh, very much that we need and, and to recall. I mean, we want a government that's accountable. Okay, thanks, Clint. Uh, this one's for you again. If you could improve the provincial health care system in two ways, what would those priorities be? Priorities would be um, getting a, a system that works for the majority of people. I would like to say all people, but you're not going to be able to satisfy everybody. So I would say the majority. Uh, you need to have people of all aspects on that board. And what I mean by that is you've got to start with the administration, find out where the loopholes are, what is working, what isn't working, and getting people the care that they need. You just can't have people just sitting there idling once they're getting collecting a paycheck and not looking after the people that, that they're getting paid to look after. So to me, is you, we need to get it back to where doctors are doctoring and not being politicians. You should not walk into an ER needing an x-ray, knowing that's the only x-ray place in the city, and told that you should go to a walk-in clinic first. That should not happen. If you're there, you should wind up being able to get the care that you need, and if you got to come back for whatever, for your x-rays or for MRI, but at least you're on the list, if that's where it is, why you're walking to a walk-in clinic where somebody else is doing something minor, where they can stitch somebody up, sure, at, at a walk-in clinic. But in an ER, if you need an x-ray or something, that's where you really should go and be able to get it, and a doctor should be telling you where, where you should be going, or a nurse or whatever, or saying you're not sick enough. Good, thanks, Clint. Phil? Um, I, I agree with a lot of stuff that Clint said, too, about that. Um, I think there's an easy solution. When you talk about common sense in, in politics, um, what I don't understand is, you know, the, the provincial government uh, gives a lot of money to our university system. If we have 400 kids that want to be doctors, why do we only accept 40 into the medical program? That's an easy fix. And why, why if we have 500 nurses apply to be in nursing school, why do we accept 70? Why? It, it, it makes no sense. So as a, as a provincial government, why don't we direct our universities to let more students enter those programs, hire some more teachers, and keep Saskatchewan kids that want to be doctors, they're going to stay. Most of them aren't going to leave, and that's the problem, right? So, um, yeah, our, we're hearing it all the time now. Our nurses are stressed. Our doctors are stressed. They're overworked. There's not enough people. Why doesn't the government just say, here, let's just start letting some more people into medical school? and some more people into nursing school. It's not, it's not hard to figure that out. Uh, the other thing too is that uh, with technology now, and you know, we, we, there's a lot of talk about private and public medical care. Uh, there, are, there are certain things that uh, private medical care can do for the province to take some of the stress off of the provincial system. And I think that uh, you know, partnering with physicians and, and other people that are in the profession, they can tell us exactly how to do it and it does, it's not rocket science again um, it, you know if, if it's six months to get an MRI and we can start letting private companies set up MRIs why not let them do it thanks Phil uh, Phil this one's back to you what is your opinion on oil gas and coal energy versus green energy like wind turbines okay well I'm uh, being from the southeast I am a huge uh, advocate for oil, gas, and uh, energy. Um, I think that 
We know, we know there's a lot of problems with wind. Um, and I'm going to just tell you guys this real quick because I only get two minutes. But just to transport a one wind turbine from Ontario to Saskatchewan, uh, I know that you think it's not that expensive, but it's a half a million dollars. The minimal cost to decommission internet and data area, it's a target. And uh, a lot of the stuff that I've been reading is, is there, uh, the way that the government is trying to sell this is that it, oh, well, it'll make access to social services easier. It'll make it easier to uh, apply for welfare. Well, it is pretty easy to do right now. And, uh, and honestly, if you, if you, you know, they're saying, well, what if you don't have a, a computer? Well, you can go down to the office and fill in the paperwork. Uh, the, the, the idea that uh, you have to have everything simple and at a click of a button is, it's, it's ridiculous when it comes to uh, the data that they're trying to capture. And we know that the use is not going to be just for what they're saying it's for. It's going to be overreach and they're going to be looking into everything that you do, whether it's, you know, I went, I went to, um, you know, I went to Earl's for dinner tonight. Oh, look, there he goes. He's the digital ID. He popped in there and it, it already happens sometimes if you've got your Facebook on and your, and your location. You know, tell us about your experience at Earl's. Well, how did you know I was at Earl's? Well, you're, it's tracking your phone. So I'm totally engaged in Thanks, Phil. Um, this is a bit of a long question, so I'm just going to paraphrase it. it it's uh, in regards to Saskatchewan and building their own or uh, forging ahead with our own police force. Um, basically, the question asks is, um, are you in favor of it and why? Okay. Um, Historically, I would say the RCMP has had a place in Canada uh, as a police force. Uh, when you look back um, through time, there was a necessity because just because of the vast size of Canada and, and a lack of organization for policing, um, they served a purpose. Uh, I believe that uh, you know, following Ontario, you know, a provincial police department, it serves us well to do the same or similar type of thing. Another type of policing that I think is a very good way to do it is, and I'll give you a quick example. So if we go to a sheriff or a localized vote for a sheriff for policing in a community, um, you bring a fresh cadet out of uh, Regina, out of Depot, and he's from Quebec, and they place him in Estevan. Well, he doesn't know anybody in Estevan. He has no idea who is up to no good. Uh, but if you had a local sheriff who was elected in, democratically and then hired officers they know everybody who's up to no good in the area and it makes policing way more effective and less cost uh, uh, less less cost um, that's a bad word but anyways it, it's less expensive because they are able to do the policing at a, at a greater level and more efficiently so um, I think that's the step to go and we all know that uh, unfortunately the RCMP are a federally based uh, police force and we've seen it recently that they're under the direction of whatever Ottawa tells them to do and uh, as we become more autonomous in Saskatchewan we're going to need to really look at who that RCMP is serving. Are they serving us? Not really. They are protecting the community but at the end of the day they serve Ottawa first. Clint? I have to agree with you Phil. Uh, I'm, I'm for uh, the RCMP was actually formed during the Louis Riel Rebellion, and it was there for to be different from the military. And for me now, it's, it's, it's basically basically the, the prime minister seems to be whatever he wants them to do. To do, we need a, a police force that's going to hold the government accountable. But at the same time, you need a government that's going to hold the police force accountable, and it's got to go both ways. So to me, that's where we need to go, and provincially is, is the way it is. And if we are going to do autonomy, we need to have our own police force in the province. And if we have to separate, we need to create that, that police force that, however big we land up getting, can um, police the areas that we want policed in the way we want them policed. Thanks. Um, Clint, this will be for you. How do you think that provincial leaders should guide or expect the MLAs to vote? Via party line, in agreement with their conscience, or any other way? I believe that uh, we have a very vast, big area of province. Uh, we have different uh, resources in different parts of the province. And what's 
and you can look at it into the provinces, even in from cities to rural, there's a big difference. So you can't expect somebody out in the country to vote like somebody would in the city, and you can't vote, expect this person in the city to vote some way the guy will out in the country. Because they're both two different uh, aspects of, uh, of the region. Uh, somebody might be against uranium. Well, so since they're not educated in knowing what, how good uranium is for our province, um, they got to vote for where they live because they know what's best for that area but not for all of the province. So to me, they need to uh, be accountable to the people who voted them in and not to the party. Thanks, Phil. Well, that's one of the things that I really like about the Buffalo Party is, is uh, first and foremost, uh, the Buffalo Party does not have a whip. And uh, for those that don't know what a whip is, in political terms, it's the person who rallies potential people who may not vote with the party. So when, when I was looking at Buffalo and, and uh, learning about the party, that was important to me because, um, it, and it's true, it's 100% true that I represent the people of my community. Is That's my job. So same values may not occur in Regina as they do in, in Estevan, but at the end of the day, if you're, an, if, if you're the leader of the party and you have your, your group of elective MLAs and you're part of the uh, uh, process of creating legislation, everyone's not going to agree and everyone's going to have their own opinion. And we're not going to force anybody to vote a certain way. But at the end of the day, democracy rules. So you might not like it and you might vote against it. But if it's a democratic vote within the party to pass the legislation or to put legislation forward, you just have to live with it. And, and we've seen that as the Buffalo Party has grown here and, and uh, as, as an entity, those things happen, right? Sometimes uh, you don't necessarily get what you want, but at the end of the day, it's democracy and that's the way it is. And you live with it. And maybe on the next bill, your side will prevail and the other people just live with it and you get along. Right? So that's the important part about uh, the Buffalo Party is that we don't force people to vote a certain way if it's not in, in the guidelines with their conscience and how they want to vote. Oh yeah, Clint already went. I got lost there, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was going to happen just once. I'm sitting here trying to figure out what next question to ask. And, have you considered how to approach and stand against pressure from the federal government to ensure things that you believe are wrong for Saskatchewan people? Okay, this is, this is where I was talking about, um, it's time to stand up to the federal government and, and we don't have politicians right now uh, that are willing to do that and, and they, they try to act like they do. Uh, we gotta remember where SAS Party came from. SAS Party, people, can, you know, have, they have an image of being conservative, and, and Brad Wall was a, a conservative leader. Um, I like Brad Wall. This is not Brad Wall's government, and people need to forget about that. So, uh, what happens is, is uh, they they have intent, right? Where they, where I, I just call it political posturing that they are trying to stand up to the federal government. And an example is is the Sask Party taking the federal government to court on the carbon tax. Well, it's a, it's a no-win situation in court. Uh, Trudeau and and uh, and Mo both look good. Trudeau says, "Hey, I stopped those Saskatchewan rebels from stopping the carbon tax." Scott Mo says, "Hey, I took them to court. We lost. We tried. Have we heard anything about the carbon tax since from the SAS party? Nothing. They're just going to live with it. Well, that's our job. We're not going to live with it. The, the the carbon tax is is a <laughs> it's a uh, way to make Saskatchewan poor. And, and that's, that's exactly what the federal government wants to do. They don't like the fact that we're successful, hardworking people here. They want us to be poor and the carbon tax has got to stop and you need politicians that have a strong enough personality to shut it down and just stop it. And the other thing too that it, it offends me as a, as a citizen, a tax on a tax is illegal. Anywhere in the world you can't tax a tax. right? So we need to stop the carbon tax and, and just and I hate to say it, but have the balls enough to say no. We're not going to do it. We're not going to collect it. We're not going to remit it. And what are you going to do? 
There's nothing they can do. Uh, and I agree with Phil. I mean, we've got a very strong province. We've got a very strong crown. We're not accounted. We don't need the federal government's money. So why are we not making a stronger force? I mean, we're not like Alberta, where we've got rid of all our crowns, and you've got everything publicized there, So, and, and you're running in a deficit. We have a very strong province with lots of resources, and we can go, okay, you want... So you want a carbon tax, that's fine. So we're not going to send you any oil. We're not going to give you any money that comes from our oil, all the royalties that you want from that there to go to our favorite province, Quebec. We're going to say, no. You, you taxed us on it, so now we're going to say we're not going to send it. We'll send it everywhere else, but we're not going to send it to you. Get somewhere else, because you're already shipping a whole bunch of stuff from, from overseas into, into Canada, and why are we not using our own resources? You know, we need to make it ourselves a strong province. Ralph Klein did it, why can't we? You know, he built a very strong Alberta, so I say let's build a very strong Saskatchewan and keep it going and not sell it. Okay, Clint, this one's for you. Um, what's one area or sector you'd like to see Saskatchewan become a leader in? Self-government. Strong. I'd like to see us become a lot stronger province and stand up to, to the, the federal government. Because if one province, just look at the convoy, it started off very small. Look how big it got. Look how scared the federal government got. Imagine having a very strong Saskatchewan government that cared about its people first. They'd be afraid of that, because why? Because they don't like democracy. This province this in this country was built on democracy and we need to get it back. Uh, the sectors that I would like to see Saskatchewan lead in, um, there's a couple. I'd like to see us lead in agriculture. Uh, part of the government's role is to secure places to sell our uh, agriculture products around the world. Uh, the more people that we are able to sell to when there is times of trouble, when there's times of war or, or uh, circumstances, uh, we're not hurt provincially in, in the finances as much because we have multiple places to sell our products. Uh, number two, I want to see us lead the world, and especially Saskatchewan, in oil production. Uh, there's no reason why Saskatchewan shouldn't be drilling as much oil as they can and upgrading it here. We should, we should upgrade our oil, sell it at a higher dollar value and make Saskatchewan a wealthy province and a, and a place to be. Uh, the, the thing that is, I think is huge for us to do and be a leader in the world is carbon capture. The carbon capture facility, uh, which uh, we know now that the technology has been uh, fine-tuned, uh, we're able to, uh, we, we could build carbon capture facilities at a greatly reduced cost. And so what we can do is make the green people happy. We carbon capture all the power plants in Saskatchewan. We create very good jobs for people in Saskatchewan. And we create a great tax base for the province of Saskatchewan. Uh, there's no transition time. There's no shutting down uh, power plants, no shutting down coal. Uh, nowhere in the world, China's you know building uh, 20 mega mines a year and with no carbon capture. And then what we do is once we keep uh, refining carbon capture facility production then once we have all of our power plants in the province done then we start to teach the world and we send our Saskatchewan people with their good jobs and good training to teach China how to build them and we teach other countries exactly to build the same thing that we've created this this fantastic technology for and guess what the world's a better place all around and we still have uh, very lean inexpensive coal to use for uh, power and Thanks, Phil. Okay, bear, bear with me on this one. So it, um, we had uh, questions that were sent in to us. We had some questions presented today at our meeting as well. And two of them are very close, so I'm going to try and combine them into one question here. Currently, there are many different right-leaning groups that are either working towards provincial party status or they're trying to influence the government. Also, there's a lot of people that are looking at the Buffalo Party. How would you go about bringing those people into the party under one umbrella or um, soft starting or, or slow rolling 
uh, people that are that are looking at the party. Okay, I again uh, we're aware of uh, people who uh, have very similar values to what the Buffalo Party uh, represents right now, and, and and they're in different areas in the province, and and they all, uh, you know, have at some point talked about the Buffalo Party. Um, <clears throat> Again, we need to lead by example. We, we kind of talked about this earlier today. We have a product. We have a good, you know, we had a great showing in the last election. Um, people, same thing, it's, everybody wants to be the leader until you find out what it takes to become someone to run for a leader. It's the same thing, everybody wants to start a party, but then when they realize, holy, this isn't easy to do. And, and the Buffalo Party found that out real fast that in order to get all of the signatures, just the signatures, to get your party registered in a province is a lot of work. And people don't want to do the work. And, that, and that's, the, that's the thing that, as a, as a leader and as a party, we can show the other people who want to have a party that we can lead. And like, like we've said, we're more than happy to have you buy a membership, take a seat at the table. We've got a policy and, and governance uh, convention coming up. You can come and be a part of that. And, and for whatever parts of the uh, policy that you like and, and things that you want to represent, bring them to them and they'll get voted on by the membership. And that's what a member-driven party is. And I think that if those people will truly want to make a change in Saskatchewan, we've got a great, we've got a great product to present, we've got a good party, we've got a, we have a plan, we have a constitution. All of these things that people who are saying they want to start a party, they haven't even done. So, uh, like I said, we would welcome them uh, to be a part of it, and, and it'll just help our team be stronger. I agree with you, Phil. I mean, we have a very good foundation, and, and, that, and as, as we go along, I mean, they're going to have to start, if they want to try to do anything close to us, I mean, they've got a lot of work ahead of them, and we're here. They just need to come in, and this is a start. I mean, with me and Phil up here with leadership, and then after that, we're going to be doing our... Uh, mandates and stuff and, and putting forward to uh, what the party is looking for to put everything out there so that everybody knows what the party is behind and it's going to take people and if they're looking at trying to recreate one like Phil says we're here so come join us come listen to us and we're going to listen to you and maybe we can find some common ground okay Clint this one's for you uh, would you be supportive of nuclear power in Saskatchewan and why? Yes, I would be. Uh, um, I've been around it. I've uh, studied it being an electrician. It's a, actually it's a very um, clean uh, power. And uh, Cigar Lake, where I was, is one of the best uranium uh, mines and areas in, in the world. People want our uranium for nuclear power. We just have to just make sure that it's mined safely, transported safely, and knowing who is uh, using it in the right ways and not for, for war, but for actually power. And that's, but yes, I mean, we've got it here, why not use it? Okay. Uh, well, we finally disagree on something. So <laughs> this is, uh, um, I'm not a, a fan of small nuclear, um, there, and there's, and I, I think there's a bunch of reasons. Uh, the expense to uh, build small nuclear is expensive. Uh, the power that's that's generated from a small nuclear facility uh, has a limitation of uh, size. So, to, you know, when you start looking at uh, powering Regina or or, or a larger city, um, small nuclear is not an answer. Um, the other thing too. Uh, when you know everybody likes the idea of small nuclear, but do I want a nuclear uh, facility within 10 miles of my house? I don't. Um, what people tend to forget is that nuclear facilities are a target for terrorism, and it doesn't matter where they are, uh, they can cause a great amount of damage. And if they're not patrolled and, and watched, um, it doesn't take very long to create an underground uh, nuclear uh, reaction that can be dangerous for any community with nuclear fallout. Uh, the other thing, Canada doesn't have the facilities to store nuclear waste. Nuclear waste is a huge problem, uh, and it and it and it happens. So, uh, you know, well, I've, you know, people have said, well, we can transport it to here, we can move it to there, put it underground. 
Well, okay, so in Saskatchewan in a blizzard, we're transferring a bunch of uh, spent nuclear rods that happen to go into the ditch in Winnipeg on their way to Ontario. It's a real problem. So, uh, and then and at the end of the day, the cost to the people of Saskatchewan, it's, it's not a savings over what we already have established in safe coal. Um, and the last thing I'll say about it is there's no jobs. Uh, to run small nuclear is very limited in terms of uh, staffing and uh, we need good jobs for people in Saskatchewan so I'm against small nuclear. Can I reply to that? No. <laughs> <laughs> you two can duke it out in the parking lot after. <laughs> this isn't question period. <laughs> well it is but you just provide answers. Okay, we'll do a few more here, uh, a couple more. Um, obviously, Phil, you're up. Do you think that, that's, that the Saskatchewan education system requires any changes? And if so, what changes would be important to make? Um, I think in terms of education, uh, I, I, I think we need to get back to basics. I think we need to be teaching, um, focus more on the ABCs of education and not taking the lead from, uh, it, it seems like every time in education someone says something, they make a change and, and uh, kids are not prepared to go out in the real world. They're not taught finance, they're not, uh, you know, I'm in the banking industry, there's so many kids that come into the bank at 18 years old that don't even know how to fill in a check. Like it, 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 not that there's a lot of checks going around anymore, but we need to get back to basic education and, and teach them credit and teach them life skills uh, that, that are important to survive <coughs> beyond mom and dad's house. And I, and, and I think that uh, the other thing too is the, <coughs> the children wearing masks at school to me is little, is, is offensive. Uh, we, you, you, Little, little kids need to see faces. That's how they interpret uh, just their, their security and their safety, right? Is this person mad at me or is this person happy to see me? Um, if, if the teacher's wearing a mask, uh, like, to me, <laughs> the teacher's standing at the front of the class and they're, they're solid 10 feet from any of the kids. Uh, do they need to wear a mask? Because I don't believe it's gonna travel that far. So masking children, forcing them to breathe un unhealthy air, and wearing masks that should be replaced every three hours, which are not. Uh, they're, they're, it's, it's horrible. And so that's the other thing that I would do is we would never mask kids uh, in school. Thanks, Phil. Clint? I do believe that our education system uh, needs to be uh, updated. It's still the old-fashioned way. You walk into a classroom, the teacher sits at the front, and everybody else sits around and at their desk and they do their work. Most jobs now do not have you working alone anymore. It's people around a table talking, discussing, and making plans. We need to get our, our uh, school systems able to promote our trades, to create more jobs, so we're not having a shortage of trades people. And letting people know that being in the trades is not a bad thing. You can make more money, some people can make actually more money in the trades than they can as a doctor. But yet, you go into the school system and what do they want you to do? You need to go to university. Why? Because that is where the money goes for the government. Into the teachers, into the funding and everything else. We need to promote our trades and our mining and the stuff that we have in this province to use to the best of our knowledge and treat in our students should be learning about Saskatchewan, what's here for jobs and, and getting them ready to get out into the workforce and like Phil says, educate them so that they can be successful when, once they get out of grade 12. So they know how to fill out a check, they know how to do a budget and what it's going to cost them. Thanks Clint. Um, next one. As an elected representative, how would you approach Aboriginal rights and land claims? That's, that's a good question. I actually got into some of that on the, in the by-election. Um, and we need to treat them with respect, um, the resources, 
their trees and stuff like that. If it's on sacred ground, we should not be mining. We should be finding other ways to promote their areas, keep them working. They have a lot of the resources, unfortunately, when the government sent them to their uh, reserves, didn't realize that this day and age is where most of the, the good stuff is that we need to mine. But at the same time, we have to um, respect their uh, heritage. Well, um, number one, uh, most of the, uh, it's a federal issue right now. And as a province, we would, you know, you have to uh, defer to land claims you know, with the, based what the federal government is deciding. Uh, as we create our own autonomy, I think that uh, uh, when we look at, as opposed to, um, we should be partnering with the indigenous communities around Saskatchewan. And rather than uh, simply uh, providing handouts, start to create a sense of, and I hope, I, I hope the SAS party is watching this because it will, might see it in the news, but we start to, Build a sense of community beyond just a reserve. So, uh, when you look at reserves and what's happening, you know it's a place for them to live. But there's no structure in terms of businesses to start to grow their community. So, I think as a government, we can lead and partner with uh, uh, indigenous communities to develop small towns. Um, you know, put put a gas station in, put a little grocery store in, and let them start to uh, rather than you know taking just money from the government, we start to build their communities and. Where they where they uh, they're happy to, to be there because now guess what they have their own businesses they can hire people and and start to grow a real community just just like Carlisle or any of the small towns in Saskatchewan and I think that um, uh, the Indian community the indigenous community would love that so that's that's what I would do is trying to promote a partnership where we start to grow uh, their communities into uh, small towns. Okay, I'm going to make this the last question. Uh, what is your strongest area of interest in the province? Well, I, my strongest area of interest is to uh, promote our natural resources to the world. Uh, Saskatchewan, the only way that, the way the federal government is printing money right now, the only way that we will ever be able to recover uh, for our kids, our grandkids, their grandkids, and their grandkids to get out of the debt that's being created today is to maximize our natural resources, maximize our presence around the world, and and um, put agriculture, our natural resources, whether it's oil, uranium, gas, and sell it to the world and lead the world in production and sales of our products and promoting our products, and that's the job of government. You know, we let the people who in Saskatchewan know how to do the business of getting the products ready. We help them reach out to the world to create the contracts to sell the products to the world. That's that's what I think is the biggest role of government. It's not so much uh, uh, taking the lead in you know saying, hey, you know, you, you know, you should drill a uh, uh, an oil well here. That's not our job. We know. We don't, we're not going to know how to do that, but we are help business succeed and then uh, again make Saskatchewan the place to be in, in the province and, uh, and take full advantage of the natural resources that we have. Thanks, Bill. Clint? My main thing and stuff is, is one part that we are missing out in agriculture is, is our small farms. It's getting more and more into big business and to me that's okay too, but that's hurting the smaller communities because you're getting more and more people out of that. So I like to see saving some of our, our smaller family farms instead of it all becoming more into big business. Easier for the government if it's all big business, but it, it hurts our small communities. And for me as our resources, we need to refine them. I totally agree with Phil. We need to have, instead of trying to uh, shut down our refineries, build more. Build the things that we need to, to make ourselves efficient. Okay, thanks gentlemen. I'm gonna go off script here a little bit. 
Um, Clint, you can start. I'm going to give you two minutes for uh, any closing remarks or anything you want to say as uh, before we adjourn. I'd just like to thank for, uh, Phil and, and Chris for giving us this opportunity to, uh, to have this platform to, uh, to, to debate the stuff that's important and that people are finding that's important for our province to help us become better leaders for this province. And Phil for coming forward to uh, put his name forward for leadership. It, it's not, me and him both look at it, it's not, it's not going to be an easy task being the very first leader, it, it's easier when you have somebody else to follow and, and, and passing the torch. When you're the first guy, it's, it's a little tough. I mean, sure, you got the board and you got people behind you, but it's still, uh, it, it's, it's scary, jittery, and exciting at the same time. So uh, I'm just hoping people uh, got a lot out of this debate. And uh, good luck, to Phil. Bill, you can have two minutes too. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. And I will say the th same thing to you. Like, I, I want to thank everybody who is on Facebook Live watching this today. I, I want to thank Clint for putting his name forward and the board uh, for setting up this uh, event today. It takes a lot of work. You know, when when you uh, when you start to plan these things, it's it's uh, it's more than just a couple phone calls and then and uh, people showing up. It takes a lot of work, and, and the board's done a great job. And, and uh, same with the CAs who've uh, come forward. I think that. It, it's important to know that the next election uh, is Saskatchewan, I think, has more to lose uh, than any province in the country. Uh, we've seen that our, um, the, the res when, you, when you look at the lack of respect that we get as a, as a community from Ottawa, it's embarrassing. They basically, when you know, you look at uh, what they do and the, even the press, when you read, you know, the Toronto Sun and papers like that, they have no respect for what we do here. And uh, they basically, just the way they handle the trucking convoy, they look at us as second class citizens. Um, they were offended that our trucks were there and, and slowing down their traffic. Well, we should be offended as a province for getting screwed by the federal government for like 50 years. And we just keep doing it, we keep working hard, doing the same thing, and it's just got to stop. Like at some point, we just have to say no more. And, and it just struck me that, hey, I'm, well, the traffic's bad and, and, they're, and they're honking their horns, but guess what? Those people were shoveling sidewalks, you know, providing food, bouncy castles, and the, the federal government labeled them as terrorists. But they're okay with Black Lives Matter. It's, it's horrible what is going on, and, and we are, we're a party of people who, again, we're not politicians, but we just want common sense to come back to Saskatchewan. So, again, Clint or I, either one of us are going to lead this party forward, and we're going to just do do normal, common sense things. So that's my time. Uh, thanks for being here today. Okay. On behalf of the board of directors, I want to thank both Phil and Clint for for not only putting their name forward but making themselves available for this. And you're you're really putting yourself out there for scrutiny when you do this, and it's not a decision that anybody can take lightly. And and. On behalf of the board and the members of the party, I think we need to really thank you guys for, for doing this and stepping forward. This is the next progression in our party. Um, for those of you that don't know, uh, the leadership election will be on March 25th. We will be posting Facebook Live uh, with the winner or the, the new leader. It will probably be uh, Clint, Phil and myself again. We'll announce it then. Remember, you have to purchase a membership to vote in this. This will be a email ballot will be coming out. Purchase your membership. We will send you the ballots. And uh, may the best candidate win. Going forward, um, again, the party uh, social media pages will not be answering questions for the candidates. Reach out to them. They both have their own, uh, their own Facebook profiles. Or you can reach them if you have any more questions. Um, I'm sure people will. And again, this is, this is a big step forward in the party and I want to thank all the board members that are here. I want to thank members of the party that come to Regina today to, to meet earlier. We've been sitting here since 1.30 going over uh, a lot of uh, party business. And hopefully this is still a party that everybody believes in. I know I do. I know these two gentlemen do. And I know the board of directors does. So 
again, this is uh, this is a big step forward. And once we once we announce the leadership on March 25th, we're going to change gears and go straight into policy and governance. And that convention takes place on May 28th and 29th, and that is where the members have the opportunity to steer the party and decide who we are and what we are and what we stand for. So whichever leader we have will now have his member-driven mandate just as we just as we wanted when we built this party over two years ago, almost two years ago, sorry. So thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, everybody that attended, and I hope uh, hope everybody learned something and maybe, uh, maybe uh, pick the candidate that they feel best represents the party. Thanks, guys. One last question for you there, Chris. When's the deadline that they must have their membership before to make this vote for leadership? Tomorrow night. What time? Tomorrow night at midnight, uh, you'll have to have your membership purchased via our website to to receive a ballot for the, the leadership. And I'd like one more last comment. A lot of people don't realize how much work this board does to put this on, but trying to get two guys on the same day, I'm pretty sure Chris is probably the board really glad there's only two of us and not trying to get five guys on the same day. Yeah, no, my... Uh, my hair started out black and now it's now it's turning gray. I'm actually only 24 years old. <laughs> so, so once again, thanks everybody. Uh, safe travels. And again, reach out to the party if you have any questions. Reach out to the candidates with your questions. I'm sure they're both going to be very active on social media for the next couple of weeks getting, uh, getting through this uh, campaign. So thanks everybody.